we all know. And we are now online, so we'll resume our meeting. So um, welcome, Earl. Welcome, welcome, welcome. So um, I understand you're from Bangkok Treasury. And of course, um, what, we'll, what we'll do now is we'll have Kirsty who will present the item. And, uh, and then we'll all be able to have uh, questions later. Through you, Madam Chair, thank you. And just um, stepping in in Ken Morris's absence, um, I actually got Yolanda here. So Yolanda, would you like to present the report or and provide context, or would you like me to do that? Uh, you can. Okay. Um, so Ken has provided a cover report simply to, um, to receive um, Earl's presentation, and um, Earl will take you through that. Just in Good morning, everyone. Just can you hear me? It's Earl here. Yes, yes, we sure did. Um, so, so, so are you are you able to hear us? No, no, you're not hearing us, are you? Earl? I can tell. Okay, we'll just, um, Kirsty, do you want to just carry on with your um, opening, and then we'll just let the governance team try and work out where we've got to disconnect. So just to provide some context, we're very much aware that our, um, our economy is um, changing okay. and rapidly, significantly. We've had um, advice provided by Brad Olson from Infometrics, and we are checking in with him as we develop the annual plan and um, progress with development of the 2434 long-term plan. Um, we will be coming back to elected members um, in the middle of December, the 13th of December, um, to talk about progressing the annual plan. Um, we would have ideally liked to have had Earl as part of that workshop. Unfortunately, he has a clash, so he's with us today just to provide an overview um, and to drill down into things that um, are relevant for us here in Waipa. Thank you. Can everybody hear me? I'm just, uh, I can hear you clearly. Oh, that's good. Can uh, You can hear us now, Earl. Yep, I can hear you. Good as Brilliant. gold. Brilliant. Okay, well, we've introduced you, so we will hand it over to you to um, run through your report. Thank you. Okay, so, so I'll just uh, share my screen, and hopefully you will see my presentation. Um, are you seeing the presentation now? No. Oh. Um, right. That's right, everyone. Just take a breather, and we'll we'll get the presentation shared. We do have a copy. How, can you see yeah, it now? Oh, we're 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 on track. Yes, we can. Thank you, Will. Perfect. Great. I just had to uh, click on another thing. Okie dokie. So, I well, thank you very much for letting me um, present, guys. It's been a bit of a while, and you know, looking back, you sort of think um, COVID certainly. Um, changed a lot of things and change, and uh, who would have thought, you know, three or four years ago that um, Teams meetings and Zooms meetings would be just, uh, you know, normal and they're, um, and, and we're all, um, no matter what age we are, we've all got our heads around them. So that's quite interesting. Okay, so what I'm just going to do today is quickly just run through where we're seeing um, the background of financial markets so, and, 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 you know, a high level view of the economy. And then I'll tie it back to, uh, you know, where the councillors at the moment and, you know, what we think that means for um, your borrowing strategy over the next, um, you know, year or so, or ne next couple of years. So, okay, so first thing is, you know, at the moment, the world is a massive contradictions. Um, we've got uh, consumer confidence in New Zealand is back towards its all-time lows. And at the moment, um, half the 31% uh, of respondents say that it's a bad time to buy a major household good. So that's got quite significant ramifications for the outlook for retail in general. You know, people aren't, you know, to, to, to put that in perspective, during COVID, that was a, a strongly positive number, you know, um, linked to all that stimulus that was washing through the economy. So we've got really weak consumer confidence. We've got um, people are still spending, even though consumer confidence is weak. Um, but we are seeing some signs of stress. Now that, that light blue line is the value. And as you can imagine, that's going up a lot of the thing, a lot of, a lot of it's just because of inflation. So that's a sort of a um, rather graphic illustration of how much money we're spending now extra to buy the same amount of goods. So, so retail spending over the last sort of, um, you know, few quarters has started to slow after a big bounce back from the COVID um, lockdown crash. Um, 
So we're seeing retail sales going sideways um, on, on a um, adjusted, a, a volume adjusted basis, but in dollar value, we're still spending a heck of a lot more. And that's because it costs us more to buy what we want. So, so there are tentative signs of stress in that, um, in, in these numbers that, you know, people are finally starting to react to, you know, lower consumer confidence and higher interest rates, et cetera. And um, interestingly that um, food and beverage and accommodation and fuel are still below the fourth quarter of 2000 before COVID. And electronic goods volumes have plunged in clients. But what we what what we still below where, where we were before COVID, we're getting quite a strong surge in um, international tourists. So that that will that will help that sector. But but you know when you look at those, you can, you can see why you know the, the, small, the, the restaurant, the cafe, the small hoteliers, and all those kind of people, tourism operators, they're still under a bit of pressure because you know we, we're not seeing those kind of volumes that we saw historically yet. Um, then we've got house prices. Uh, this is the latest, latest Reserve Bank projections. They 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 project a 20% fall from the November 21 peak. So the peak in the housing market here in New Zealand was this time last year. So if you paid a million dollars for a house, these guys are saying it's going to be worth 800,000 at the at the peak at the at, in the you know at, at the worst level. Now, um, some of the banks were talking 12 to 15, and they're starting to move towards this sort of level or even more. So. Um, with the latest um, cash rate hikes and what's going on there, um, we suspect that this 20% is may even be a little bit light. So, in, so so far, I haven't se haven't sort of shown too much good news, have I? So, you know, um, interesting. <laughs> and then, if we look at um, let's look let's look somewhere where things are sort of going okay so far. So, Australia is one of, is still our, is our, one of our biggest trading partners, and um, that's it's a two-edged sword with Australia because one, we do a lot of trade with them, but two. Um, they also tend to uh, like our workers, um, despite all the uh, all the rhetoric about 501s and other things. You know, um, New Zealanders are very, very popular with Australian employees, employers. So, as you can see, um, you know, investment in Australia is still activity still holding up. I think there was a add on one ZB last week or two ZB, whatever it's yeah, two one ZB last week. Uh, a guy, a, a Kiwi bloke who runs Mineral Resources, a big um, mineral company in WA. He's looking for a thousand workers. He said he'd take. If he, if it, you know, and he's at, they're doing big, big advertisements all throughout New Zealand. He said, if I, if I got 200, I'd put them on a plane tomorrow. And they're talking, you know, 100,000 Aussie starting wages going to 150,000 in, um, you know, four months when you're trained up to drive a digger and stuff like that. So, so that kind of drain is starting again because what's happened is the mining sector over there has done very well from high, high prices over the last few years and lower costs, and now they're having to, you know, um, expand again. So. You know that's that's a that's that's a positive for us from a trade point of view, but a negative from our employment situation, which is you know still really really tight. And um, but the other thing in Australia is this: we're starting to see um, some nervousness around from business around investing because of where they think interest rates are going. So business investment is weak, and we're starting to see that here in New Zealand as well. So the big spending, the big spenders in New Zealand at the moment are central and local government. Um, we're starting to see a bit of infrastructure spend because they're catching up, but the, 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 the mainstream businesses are getting a bit nervous around the um, around the prospects of higher interest rates and it's uh, deferring some of their investment decisions. So that's got a you know that's that's not great for the outlook over the next year or two. Our biggest trading partner, China, um, their activity is slowing, and this is all about their COVID lockdowns, right? Uh, well, there's two things there. It's the, the, the COVID lockdowns have a big impact on their manufacturing and uh, sector and their production. Um, and that, that, that in turn falls into um, you know, fixed asset investment, retail sales plunging because, you know, people are locked up. But also the, um, the housing market there um, makes ours look um, like it's booming. And that's, that's sucking a lot of um, wealth effect and, and spending from, that, from the, um, the retail sector. So, you know, China's the second biggest economy in the world now and our largest trading partner. So if China continues to bumble along, you know, that's got ramifications, for example, for our for, the, for, for milk prices and things like that, which directly impacts on our economy. And the news over the last few days where people are protesting about the lockdowns and now the Chinese government's um, responded with, you know, a significant rollout of police presence to squash the um, protesting. You know, that doesn't augur well for the next three to six months or even year for, you know, what kind of demand we're going to see out of China. So... You know that's not so great, and there's you know there's the um, property sector in China. 
So, you know, sales are collapsing, um, investment growth and everything is collapsing. They've got a huge oversupply. I think the the stats are something like about 25 to 30 million apartments that are empty in China at the moment. The big problem is a lot of these developments haven't been finished. So the government's pumping a lot of money to the banking sector to actually finish the apartments so that people can actually have what they're paid for. But, you know, going forward, a lot of the speculative activity in the Chinese housing market where everybody has a, has a rental property, even though it's not, um, nobody lives in it, um, you know, that's, that's, that's starting, to, um, starting to reverse. And property is a big part of the Chinese economy. So th that's, that's having a real, um, a real drag on domestic consumption. And then if we look at the US, the US is not in recession. The US is still doing pretty well. Um, but, and they're, they're interesting because in the US, most people have a 30 year mortgage. And while, you, while you, um, your, mortgage is, your mortgage interest rate is set over the 30 years of the term, you have a free option. So if interest rates go down, you can actually ring up the bank and say, I want to repay that mortgage and, and either renegotiate a new rate at the market rate, or, you, or you can, if, if another bank will finance you, you can actually switch. So having a fixed rate mortgage for 30 years in the US is not as dire as it sounds. And the reason why it works like that is because the, 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 the view in the US is the banking sector can hedge that risk. So, you know, let's just have an easy product. Your mortgage, your mortgage is a table mortgage over 30 years. You have a fixed interest rate, but if you refinance, that's our risk. So that you can see it. So in the last year, that, that fixed rate mortgage in the US, is, which most people have, has gone from 3% to over 7%. So that's a huge impact, but that's quite delayed. So what that, that directly impacts new sales and new borrowers, but it doesn't impact on existing. Um, unlike here in Australia, where you know interest rates flow quite quickly through to the household budgets, so this is having an impact on the U.S. construction sector because people can't afford to buy new houses at these kind of levels of interest rates, so that slows down future building activity, which is a big part of the U.S. economy. But it, but that's why the U.S. economy's you know the, the U.S. punter is nowhere as near, you know is, is not so um, concerned at this stage about spending because this is, this isn't flowing through, but this will have an effect over time. It's just quite a big lag. Um, so, you know, so you look at that. So you've got the domestic outlooks looking not, not that great. Um, the international outlook, um, is looking a bit mixed at best. And we've got a central bank that's doing the most aggressive interest rate hikes in, um, you know, in history, basically, since we've had a, since we've had a, a OCR um, in the US, it looks as though you know that, that they're thinking the Fed might be just about finished. So long-term rates are there starting to come down. Um, you know they've gone from 4.2 down to 3.6. You know so longer-term interest rates in the US look as though they might have peaked. Um, here, our long-term rates are coming back as well. Um, the 10-year rate, which is the long-term, you know, the, the long-term risk-free rate. Um, is priced in more, it's more worried about recession than inflation, and it also um, follows um, offshore moves. The Reserve Bank here, they're, um, they're, they're, um, they've been adjusting down there um, where they see the neutral cash rate. Now, this neutral cash rate is a concept, it's not a thing. Um, so what, they, what they've been saying is, you know, over the last 20 years, as... Um, prices globally have been under pressure. We've had low inflation because of, you know, um, technology changes, lots of supply out of Southeast Asia, China exporting deflation really with its cheaper and cheaper products. So that, that took the neutral interest rate down lower. The neutral interest rate is a concept that says, if the rate's higher than that, it's contract, it, it's contract, it'll contract demand. If it's lower than that, it should be stimulatory. So the Reserve Bank now assesses the neutral cash rate is somewhere between two-ish and four-ish. So, where the cash trade is currently, we're, you know, we're definitely tightening, but this is their long-term one. In their short-term one, they, they, they say it could be, a, the neutral rate could be as high as 5%. So that's why they're looking to tighten a bit more. So, you know, we are, we are in a, um, the cash rate now is not stimulatory, but it's argument, it's, there's an argument around actually, you know, how high does it need to go to actually really sort of suppress demand. And here's what we're seeing with the cash rate and what's happened. So back in July, the market was expecting the cash rate to be um, here in New Zealand around about 4%. And then that was the peak and it was going to slowly drift, drift lower. Um, so the, the peak was ex so the peak was expected to be um, about now and then that, that was done. In the US, similar sort of thing. 
peak about the same, but quite an quite an aggressive easing cycle from there in the US. So peaks are peaks three seventy five and back below three by you know within twelve to eighteen months. The market's now pricing in a peak here of at least five fifty, and it's staying there for quite a period of time. In the US, a peak of five and then slowly starting to decline. So so you can see in just in five what is it five months um, four months. Uh, expectations around where the cash rate has to go to suppress inflation have actually changed quite dramatically. Now these moves, to put, uh, these are once in a lifetime moves. The speed of increase in interest rates we've seen this year is unprecedented. You know, this is not normal stuff. This, these, are, these are very, very unusual moves, but it's all about inflation. And so this is, this is a graph of inflation. We've got one, two, three, four, five, six countries there, the major economies. And as you can see, so between, you know, Inflation never really got over three anywhere. So since um since and and it and it collapsed to zero after COVID because of lack of demand, right? Now in, in some some domiciles in the European Union it went below zero. So as you can see, there's been a huge bubble in inflation. Now you might think back to you know three or four years ago when you know all the stim stimulation was go stimulus was going on back in the GFC times in 2008, and then. You know, people are going, oh, it's different now. If you pump a lot of money and create a lot of money in the system, it doesn't create inflation anymore. It's just, you know, it's we're in a new paradigm. And, and all the economists are scratching their head and going, how does that work? Well, all what this shows is that you can't actually defy gravity. And it just took a while, but they pumped enough in and COVID was the biggest sugar rush we've ever seen from central banks and governments. And the uh, prices reacted like theory tells us. So this is what they're worried about. You know, they're, they're terrified that this gets embedded and, and every central bank will tell us that inflation is much worse than recession. And that's why they will do what they, whatever they have to do to get inflation down. So, you know, if that's why all came out last week and said, I am, gonna, I am going to cause a recession because his view is that's all he, the tools he's got in front of him, that's all he can do. And this is just to show the speed of how things have accelerated. So back this time last year, the ANZ, who were the, probably the most aggressive and tightening where they think things would go, they thought the cash rate would peak under two and sit there forever. Now they think it's going to go to 575 and sit there for quite a while. So all that's happened is every sort of couple of months, they've just aggressively increased their um, their view. <laughs> so, you know, and I think, you know, their underlying sentiment is, um, you know, central banks are going to have to hike till it breaks. And it's sort of hard to argue with that, you know? I mean, you know, a recession is coming. There's no doubt about it. And th those those high short-term rates are underpinning, those those high cash rates are underpinning short rates. So the graph I show, showed you previously had the 10-year swap, you know, quite a bit down from its highs, whereas the two-year swap rate is back at its highs because that's influenced by what we do with the OCR and not what happens in the US 10-year bond market. So the yield curve here is... Um, what's called negative, which means short-term rates are higher than long-term rates. Now that's unusual because if you think about it, if you give somebody money for a day or for 10 years, in theory, you'd want a higher interest rate for 10 years because you've got much more risk. But at the moment, you get paid more for one day than for 10 years. And that's normally a sign that the market's pricing in weak growth and or recession and, and inflation coming down as well. But really, long-term markets are pricing in recession. And we can see the New Zealand, that's what I was talking about, the New Zealand yield curve. So the latest yield curve. So, you know, the cash rates are, uh, you know, sitting just close to 450 now. Um, the one year swap rates up around five and then the 10 year rates lower. So this is what is called as a negative yield curve. And that, 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 that curve typically implies a, um, you know, a recession, recession within the next 12 to 18 months. And, you know, um, Mr. Orr's told us that's what's happening. So uh, hard to argue with. Now, the biggest thing the Reserve Bank's worried about is wage growth. And there's a lot of interesting sort of beasties there, you know, LCI, and I've explained them down below, but don't get too head up on that. But what this shows is that wage growth is accelerating. You know, we're talking, you know, um, some sectors are seeing, you know, seven or eight percent wage increases. We're getting um, pay parity for nurses being talked about again now, which is thoroughly deserved, but it's going to be, you know, that's high wages. And central government is a big influence on these on these wage wage levels because what 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 what's happened over the last few years is their view is that the that short term short that wages need to go up for um you know the lower the lower paid which 
it's hard to argue with. A lot of people were grossly underpaid for what they did. Um, and then, you know, that would, and, and one, of their, one of their tools for that was to um, suppress, suppress immigration so companies couldn't bring in cheap offshore labour, exploit them and all that kind of wonderful stuff, which seemed to happen quite a bit. And then you know fill their vacancies that way. So they decided, well, let's 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 stop that little out. So that'll help get short-term wages up. But the unintended consequences is that there's all this boom going on with you know three waters, um, the DHBs, all this kind of stuff that's driving demand for you know. I mean, in the IT sector, wages have gone up about 70% because all these all these things being created require new IT systems, we create IT support. So that's going through the roof. Finance sector wages are going through the roof because typically a big source of finance staff is Southeast Asia, China, India, places like that. They can't even have to get in. So, so not only is it pushed up, it's pushed up the lower rates, tick, but it's also pushed up higher the next level more so the actual gap is, is worse than it was so you know there's always unintended consequences when you try and fiddle with the market so but the reserve bank can't worry about that they've just got to go if wages keep going up like this that's inflationary because people have to pass their costs on or go broke so you know so what what the reserve bank wants to see is wage growth slowing down they want to see inflation expectations go down because they've bumped up. You know, people are, for, for 10 years thought inflation would be 2%. Now they're suddenly saying it could be 5 So they want to see people start to think less about that. But they actually need unemployment to increase. So the Reserve Bank now sees unemployment peaking at 60%. Now, you know, we've got a pretty um, tight labour market. So that's going to, that, that means we have to have quite a significant recession, quite frankly. But what you see here is that we're in a situation where inflation's very high. The only tools the Reserve Bank really has, the only significant tool the Reserve Bank has is to put up interest rates. And what they have, what they need to do by that is increase unemployment and cause a recession. So, you know, it's not, it's not hard, you know, sitting there, unemployment has to be higher next year and we have to be in a recession. Otherwise the Reserve Bank is gonna keep on putting up interest rates and they'll keep on putting them up until inflation slows so you know it is what it is and that's the uh that's the that's the hangover from the sugar rush of all that money that was created in hindsight that wasn't needed and well, you know some of us at the time said why is the reserve bank printing 20 billion dollars but you know that's by the by but you know th there was a lot of stimulus and they they didn't stop when it was you know we had a we had the reserve bank printing money at the same time, house prices were going up by 20%, you know, 5% a month or something. You know, there was clearly asset bubbles all over the place. But now the pipe has got to be paid, doesn't it? Doesn't he? And, and this, is, this, is, this is the outlook. And it's pretty hard to come up with an um, outlook that's going to go, oh, this, none of this is going to have to happen. You know, I can't, we can't think of any scenario where we're not going to have to have higher unemployment. And that's going to happen by an engineered recession. And here's where inflation is, tradables inflation, which is imported inflation. Um, you know, that's running around about 8%. A lot of that's transport, energy. Now, the good thing is that oil prices are falling quite sharply. The Kiwi dollars recovered a bit, so we will have a bit of relief from that. But, um, you know, food prices are still sticky, and then you've still got trade issues. And if China continues lockdowns, that'll be high. But tradable inflation tends to, um, you know, it can come back quite quickly. So that's, that's positive. But at the moment, traders inflation is up at 8%, which is very high. Um, here's the petrol price I was talking about. Hopefully that's going to, you know, that red line, we're going to start to see petrol prices come back, which will be, have a little bit of an impact on inflation, which will be better. But oil prices are still much higher than this time last year and the Kiwi dollar is still weaker. So, you know, it's going to be a while before oil prices, get uh, petrol prices of the pump get back to anywhere near where they were in, before COVID. And then non tradable inflation is actually heading back towards, you know, is very high as well. Now, this non tradable inflation is um, a lot of it's housing construction costs and, you know, um, council rates are, are an impact. Now, the thing about council rates is that, you know, you guys are directly linked to higher energy and construction costs, right? So stuff you do typically is things that you have to pay more for. So, you know, it's pretty hard to escape inflation when you've actually, you know, the day-to-day -day things councils do are getting more and more expensive. So, you know, so, you know, and the government as well, all these big construction programs and things, you know, all the input costs are getting getting higher and higher. So we've got, it's not, it's not as if we're having a sort of one-off non-tradables inflation in, in, impact. 
or a one-off trader was inflation impact, inflation is pretty well embedded right across all parts of the economy, which is what, what the Reserve Bank's worried about. Here's some good news. The international visitors recovery is accelerating. So it looks as though we're going to get a lot of tourists over the summer. Now, you know, a lot of people enjoyed COVID in many ways because you go to places and things and there was nobody there. Well, that's not going to probably happen now. We're starting to see that's really starting to get aggressive, starting to get busy. And that's one of the reasons why, you know, um, airfares are so high because, you know, capacity is still low and the, the airlines are... Um, milking that for what they can and um, you know making money while the hay <laughs> making making hay while the sun shines that's for sure but the reserve bank expect tourism to be a large contribution over the summer now that's a positive for all those businesses hospitality accommodation tourism but it doesn't really help that inflation outlook so if we get lots of tourists that's good tick but that means they've got to go harder to stop us domestic people spending so the domestic recession has to be even worse if you, if you know what i mean so it's sort of kind of a bit of a two-edged sword really but you know that just shows oh, New Zealand opening up is, is actually quite a quite a, is, is starting to really see some positives out of that. And um, in the case of our major exports, so we use dairy as a substitute as a surrogate. So dairy prices have dropped a lot over the last sort of six or eight months, and that's main. They peaked in uh, March this year, and they're down about thirty percent from those peaks. And that's mainly to do with um, Chinese demand because of the Chinese lockdowns. Chinese buyers are very nervous about buying too much of anything. And um, so, you know, while there's a general view out there that production of milk in New Zealand this year will be lower than last year, so theoretically that normally sees a higher price, prices are falling quite a bit. And that's all, all to do with demand from Southeast Asia and China and, and the Chinese lockdowns. Now, the New Zealand dollar basically fell from, you know, 70 cents to 55 cents. So that was a huge headwind. So it, for a while, their prices were still going up and the Kiwi dollar was falling. So there was a huge um, benefit for the export sector of that weak currency. Now that started to turn around a bit. And so you start to see those lines. So, so the benefits we were getting from a weak currency offsetting lower export prices is going. So again, it's not, it's a, it was a strong tailwind. Now it's probably neutral at best. So if the Kiwi dollar continues to increase because of our high interest rates and, in, and export prices do continue to weaken, that's not so good for the export sector either, which will help the recession. So, you know, the Reserve Bank will probably almost like that. So from the council's point of view, I mean, you're entering a very large borrowing phase now, which, you know, I mean, but, you know, 10 years ago, I think it was projected you'd have a couple hundred million dollars worth of debt by now. And then, you know, things totally changed. The GFC came along, et cetera, et cetera. But back in those days, interest rates were six or 7%. So if you were, if that spending had all happened, you know, You'd be, you would have been borrowing at six or seven percent or whatever the rates were or five and a half percent and it would have been it is what it is but but we've got used to low interest rates because we had those um those those COVID distortions so um you know so the council you know you've you've, you've got to um you've, you've got to do what you do um but you've got to factor in that in the in the next year or two at least interest rates are going to be higher than what anybody expected you know not that long ago. Now, this is, you know, everybody's been caught. Every central bank's been caught out. You know, every 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 economist's been caught out. We we underestimated. You know, our view was that four percent cash rate would more than slow the economy to um, you know, to to get the Reserve Bank where to where it wanted to be. The problem is that we underestimated, like everybody else, the um the amount of money that was in the system from that stimulus, which let, let people keep on spending. So, from a council's point of view, you need to reassess. Um, your interest expense and your and your bottom line that's going to have to go up. Now, if you can defer stuff or um, or you know just manage cash flow really aggressively, that's what you've got to focus on. But at the end of the day, if you have to do things and you have to borrow, it is what it is. And you know, interest rates at four odd percent historically are still you know ten years ago you would have you you would have grabbed we would have grabbed those with both arms. So so we've just got to you know, we've got to be sensible about these things. The other thing too is that. Um, our view is we're not that keen on um, long-term borrowing at the moment. You know, unless we, if we saw that long-term rate with a three on the front, we'd be quite happy for the council to do five, seven, 10 year borrowing. But at the moment we think you're probably better off to stay, borrow a little bit short in the next year or two when the recession really hits and those interest rates fall back a bit further, then you'd extend those borrowings. So again, it's playing, it's a balancing act between, you know, um, you know, what, uh, giving certainty over the next year or two on your interest expense, but not locking in what we could see as potentially high interest rates over multi multi years. So you know, and and as I said to Ken and the team, you know, 
we look, you know, we, we should we need to analyze every drawdown, every new debt, and work out what we should be doing and, and you know what kind of time frames and manage it through your policy parameters, your policy requirements, and and you know try and get, um, um, try and sort of optimize the short, medium, and long-term outlook as best we can. But the key message is interest rates are going higher in the short term. They'll probably peak in the first quarter of next year. They're going to stay higher at the short end for a bit longer. But New Zealand is going into recession and unemployment is going to increase. So that's the backdrop you've got. So um, I'm glad that the people put their hands up to be voted in to do these jobs and be on councils. But the next year or two, you're, you're going to be earning every dollar you're paid and more, I suspect, because it's going to be it's going to be challenging. There's no doubt about it. Such optimism. Thank you, Earl. Really appreciate that. Yes, I apologise. I, I like to be optimistic, but I can't hide, put my head in the sand. Sorry. No, no. I, look, I appreciate your honesty, and I think there's, uh, this is what we kind of need. This is what we do need to hear. Uh, look, we'll ask for um, elected members any questions that you may have that you'd like to ask. We'll start with Lou. Yeah, thank you, Earl. I, I, I'm quite interested in listening to that. Having lived through the uh, 70s, we had an 18% uh, second mortgage on a property and uh, it was fairly difficult running. So we've been through this once before. Uh, well, what I wanted to ask, what do you think were the fuel prices of the 25 cents that the government has actually displaced, it's taken away, it's got two months to run. Uh, that's 25 cents would make a significant difference to all of us if we had to be paying it again. I think they've got a problem um, because <coughs> Governor Raw made it very clear to all politicians of all stripes central government that if you guys make promises around tax cuts or you make promises about a lot more spending that makes my job harder so i've got to actually be tougher on the man on the street so you know so if the government um leaves at 25 cents that's kind of stimulatory so <clears throat> you know they've got to find it from somewhere else i think you know but having said that targeted um, intervention to try and help people you know that's what they're trying to do in the UK so I think it's a 50-50 call whether they'll actually um, pull that but you're right I mean 25 cents back on fuel prices the only thing going they've got going for them is in theory fuel fr fuel prices should be falling quite a bit in the next few months because we've, we've got oil down you know about 20 percent in the last last month or so and the Kiwi dollar is up 10 percent so in theory you know we, sh we should still see lower oil prices over the next few months, even that 25 cents comes on. But you're right, it's a, it's a hard one because people's, people's, people's pockets are going to have less and less um, spare cash in them. Hmm. Okay, any other questions for Earl? Hard dose of reality, that's exactly right. Uh, look, if there are no other questions, I think that, uh, yeah, look, I just want to say thanks for coming to uh, present to us today. I think that uh, most of what you've said we probably uh, knew or could feel it, or certainly feel it's coming in our direction, and you're quite right. Our, um, our interest rate costs are something we're going to have to be very carefully budgeting for and your lander over there is nodding um, so I think we can see um, you know what that, that our, our role actually in the communities are going to be a little bit, little bit harder um, going forward okay again thanks for your presentation really appreciate it and uh, yeah no worries um, a pleasure as always and apologies I couldn't actually be there live next time I'll make sure that I, I don't have a double double clash I'd rather be I'd rather be in Tiamuta than Wellington I tell you <laughs> <laughs> Goodbye, everybody. Have a good day and good luck. Um, I take my hats off to you for doing, doing, you know, do what you do. It's fantastic. Thanks very much. Cheers. That's not very comfortable. <laughs> That's the worst thing. <laughs> All right, everybody. We'll just take a, a one-minute breather. We'll just wait. We've got our um, our next item, of course, is a feasibility report for a youth business incubator in Waipa. So we have some guests. So we'll just settle them in, and we'll be back shortly. Shane is here? Yes. Steve is there, Shane is there. Anyone else? Shane and I. Is that enough? I don't think that is enough. That's not enough, is it?
Yes, yes. I'm a little bit wrong. Call this Emma. I'm just interested. Yeah. Okay, everybody. Um, we have our guests arrived. So, look, I'm going to let Steve. Are you happy to introduce the item? You're just looking for a place to sit, aren't you? And we need you to use the microphone if that's right um, for the anyone online. So. So sorry, Steve. You, you need, need to, to use, use the microphone. microphone to present the report. <laughs> Okay, I'll hand over to Steve Tritt. Um, I'd like to introduce for the um, next presentation um, Shane Mosh from CE from the Te Aumuri Chamber of Commerce, Emma Sinclair on my right from Impact Hub, and Nanise uh, from Impact Hub. So um, Shane's going to introduce um, our proposal. Um, and this is a report back on the feasibility that the, the council um, generously funded through the annual plan, 22-23 annual plan process. And the study was to look at the establishment of a startup incubator space for youth in Waipa based in Te Aumuru. So following public consultation, elected members granted $15,000 for to the Te Aumuru Chamber of Commerce to prepare the study. Um, and that's what we're going to hear, the results of the study um, today. So I pass over to Shane. Um, Thank you, Steve. Uh, so as uh, Steve said, we're talking to you today about our proposal to set, set up a Waipa Youth Business Incubator in Te Awamutu. So I'm going to give you some background, an update on our progress, and then I'm going to pass you over to Nanisi and Emma from Impact Hub, who will present the feasibility study and tell you about their organisation. So the background, in May, I presented this proposal to elected councillors during the annual plan hearing. The proposal fits seamlessly under two themes in your economic development strategy. One, under enabling and attracting business, and also under education and youth employment. At this meeting, the council supported the concept and agreed to provide $15,000 to complete a feasibility study. In August, we presented an update to this committee. So progress to date. After considering several models and providers, we are convinced that Impact Hub are the right organization to set up the hub and carry out the feasibility study. And I want to explain to you the four reasons why we choose them. Number one, Impact Hub is an international organization. Started in London approximately 10 years ago, they are now in 60 countries with over 100 hubs. Number two, they can flex their programs depending on locations and the community issues and needs. They are tried and tested programs and support. Number three, the New Zealand Impact Hub team already have experience in setting up hubs. The first was the Waikato Impact Hub, started in Hamilton in 2019, and they have recently opened another hub in Tokoroa. The Tokoroa Hub opened about a year ago and is supported by the South Waikato Council, $120,000 over two years, and the South Waikato Investment Fund Trust have committed $150,000. And the fourth reason we like Impact Hub is they strive for a sustainable business model by leasing out space within the hub to other organizations and they become a community space. For example, in Tokoroa Hub, 
they have least space to work it. This organisation is funded by the Ministry of Social Development through the Mayor's Task Force for Jobs. They also lease out space to South Waikato Investment Fund Trust, which is a community owned trust. The hub in Tokoroa has become a community space with organisations under the same roof working towards the same end, assisting each other. So what else has happened? We have had many discussions with community organisations working to assist youth and we invited all these organisations to a co-design session to get their input to ensure we develop a hub that would meet their needs. At the co-design workshop, I was struck by two things. One was the amazing passion and enthusiasm from all in the room. And the second, and surprisingly, the fact that many of them did not know each other. It was clear that a community impact hub, working with all these organizations and as an advisory or a steering committee would be a great step forward. So we've also found a potential space for the hub, a building which would require minimum fit out costs. It's a big space and an excellent location for a community building. And the cost to rent is 65,000 per annum. And the good news is Impact Hub has been able to secure some operational funding from Trust Waikato. And the evidence of community support will assist them to secure ongoing funding. This gives them the confidence that they will, with your help, be in a position to start this project immediately. So in con conclusion, your commitment to fund 65,000 a year over the next three years will allow this project to start. So now I'll pass you over to Nanisi and Emma from Impact Hub who will provide more detail. Thank you. Thank you, Shane. Kia ora tata. Um, ko uh, Emma Sinclair toko ingoa. Um, so I am, I've been an entrepreneur and a business owner in Waipa now for a decade, um, which makes me feel very experienced. <laughs> um, I'm resident in Rotorangi and well connected in Te Wamutu, Cambridge, Kihiki, Perongia and Dohapo. And I'm really excited to be here today to present to you guys the findings of this feasibility study, which as Shane says, we've been working on now since May. And um, I wanna say we're really proud of the diligent approach that we've taken and, and the work that we've done. And we've had some really great and meaningful conversations with community and also done a considerable amount of desktop research. Um, not sure if you've all read the, the beautiful report and, and all its 46 pages with appendices and all. Um, and I hope you've found it an impressive, um, potentially hopeful, um, but also somewhat concerning re read. Because I think that um, if we start with the, with the problem and if we start with the things that could be better, um, there are a number of things that could be considerably better for youth businesses and entrepreneurs in the Waipa district at the moment. And we have found uh, through this feasibility study that specifically so for the Tiawamutu community. So the problems, as you would have seen and uh, that we've uncovered are poor retention of youth, both in the district itself and in the schools. And there's little to no support and opportunities, which helps enable meaningful success outside of the traditional and mainstream schooling. Um, there's no cohesive network for entrepreneurial support. And this is evidenced uh, by studies from MSD, Waikato Wellbeing Project, as well as our own community outreach, that there is a skill gap and a knowledge gap and a lack of connection between youth and industry, um, which goes both ways. And it means that frustrations are building youth want to com commit their time and effort to a better community. They want to contribute to the community that they live in. We know this, um, but there's not always a clear segue as to how they do that. Um, and this skill gap goes both ways. A lot of the time businesses want to engage youth. Um, they want to provide employment opportunities and training opportunities, 
but they don't necessarily speak the language um, of youth and they don't necessarily know how to um, connect with them. And succeeding in business and succeeding in work and, and in life in general is obviously not something that people are born with. It's something that, that we can learn. It's a skill that needs to be nurtured and taught. And at the same time, employers need help connecting with the younger people. So that's a little bit about the problem. And through this feasibility <clears throat> study, we've identified some solutions. Some of them in the form of physical um, rooms, event spaces, flexible office solutions, um, a professional environment that's conducive to collaboration, learning and growth for young people mm -hmm. and for everybody. So not specifically just for young people but also alternative pathways to success for young people through programs of events, workshops, and um, other community connections with mentors, partners, um, and experienced people. And bringing it all together is that network of mentors, youth support agencies, businesses, private partners. And we've identified a solution which not only has global traction and proof of concept, but it's also deeply rooted right here, here in the Waikato. And that's Impact Hub in a nutshell. It exists for the very reason that there will be no better future without better business. Um, and let's face it, we do have some work to do to build a stronger and more resilient future for WIPA. So let's take a step back and have a look at the Impact Hub Network and what the Impact Hub Network is. We are a global group of Impact Hubs that sit across 55 different countries with more than 100 hubs around the world. And in 2019, we had upwards of 17,000 members. We're across five different regions and the region that we sit in is Asia Pacific. Our networks are made up mostly of entrepreneurs, but also other sectors of society. So businesses, consultants, public, private and non-profit sector professionals also make up a good deal of our community worldwide. I can skip there. So every year, the Impact Hub Global Network conducts a survey of all of our members to talk, ask them about um, the impact that they've had and the impact that the network has had upon them as individuals and as entrepreneurs. So in the network, more than 11,000, I don't know what that one's a little bit um, fuzzy. Um, so you can't, you can't really see perfectly there, but the pie graph at the bottom shows the way in which our network um, value on environmental returns, uh, financial returns, and social returns. And what that graph shows is that our entrepreneurs tend to value uh, financial returns equally um, with societal returns and economic returns as well. I think we'll skip past that one just because it is a bit fuzzy there. So this, these graphs here show a little more about uh, how entrepreneurs in our networks feel inspired, connected and enabled. Um, so across the network, our goal is to inspire, enable and connect and our community feels significantly impacted. That's a shame that, that that graph is a little bit fuzzy, but I will just explain it a little bit. So at the very top section there, um, we've got ideation businesses that are at the very beginning of their development and right down the bottom there is scale. And that graph shows the way in which the network has moved, <clears throat> moved businesses over the course of the year. And what it shows is that a significant number of businesses move at least one stage over the course of that year. So what does Impact Hub do? I will speak to this slide and try to clarify it as much as I possibly can, because it's a little bit fuzzy there. Yeah. So Impact Hub sits at the on intersection between entrepreneurship, businesses and youth. And in the main, Impact Hub works in the yellow and green sectors there. So that's in between businesses and entrepreneurship and between entrepreneurship and youth. 
We provide support for business and entrepreneurship in a number of different ways. Um, we have a number of programs um, that support capacity building for businesses. We can get that a little bit clearer at all, not really. It's a shame we can't, we can't quite see that. But in the yellow section there between um, business and entrepreneurship, um, we're highlighting the programs and support offering that we have um, to support both businesses and, and entrepreneurs. And they range from a number of different programs to workshops to events that we run in communities to, to support those groups. And then at the intersection of entrepreneurship and youth, we've run early stage ideation programs, events and other um, yeah, events for, for community. Uh, at the bottom there, between businesses and youth, oh, that's good, we've got it maybe a little mm -hmm. bit clearer there. Um, Impact Hub works less between these two sectors, um, business and youth. So, for example, we have strategically partnered with other organisations who um, do work in these areas. So, as Shane alluded to, in the South Waikato Hub, we have in-house two different careers um, pathway to careers organizations. So the Mayor's Task Force for Jobs sits in house as does Swivel. And what that means is through the hub, we're often having both employers um, and people looking for work. And what happens is there's this magic sort of connection um, between um, young people coming in and looking for work and where they need to be supported, they can be um, directed to us at Impact Hub and forwarded into programs or other forms of support. So how can this look? Um, if we maybe skip to the next slide. So how does this look uh, in the South Waikato during our community co-design sessions? We identified that there was a strong need for digital skill development and also for entrepreneurial support. And so under the hub of the South Waikato, the, um, the South Waikato Impact Hub, we provide both of those things. So as a result, the South Waikato Impact Hub focuses on support for, we call them BFEs, so businesses, entrepreneurs, <laughs> founders, youth, and startups. And through the hub, we provide a number of different solutions. So including meeting rooms, workshops, event space, fix and flexi desks, office space, and a purpose-built digital space. So here are some pictures of our hub, and in a minute we'll take you on a video tour. Um, we've got a large workshop room, um, meeting rooms, um, down the bottom in the center is our event space and our lounge and community kitchen, which is frequented by both our residents and people coming in and out to use the meeting rooms. We'll take you on a little tour. We're in the center of the Tokoroa CBD. Um, we sit, yeah, just a little bit offside to, the, to State Highway 1. We're coming into our event and co-working space here. So people can come in during the day, hire a desk, sit down, grab themselves a coffee upstairs. We have three offices um, downstairs in a meeting room. And then we're coming upstairs now into the loft. These are our resident desks. So we have nine permanent residents that uh, occupy those desks. And this is our digital space. So through support we've found after our launch, we were able to open a digital space and that's our meeting room. So there's just a quick little tour of our hub. And I'd like to share some photographs of people actually using our space. So just as a, a, an example of the different types of organizations and activities that we've had through the hub. At the top right, we've got a group of students that come from Waikato University who have worked with our community in the hub to set up an augmented reality wall, which enables our youth to submit art and have it displayed on our big um, if you can see that you can't really see that in the top right corner we've got a, a large wall-sized mural 
Um, and then through our digital hub, we encourage the learning of those skills um, and then they can present it to community in a, a, on our wall there. Um, at the bottom, we've got our group of 10 co-creatives. So these are young people who've had uh, a creative skill or a range of creative skills, but didn't have, um, weren't really honing their skills and didn't really know what to do with their um, particular creative talents. And through our program co-creatives, we've been able to um, help them refine their business ideas, um, get them to market, um, and actually tomorrow is our showcase for that first program. Uh, then in the top right-hand corner, um, this is Matt Salapu. He is a multimedia producer who's come down to, from Auckland to work with our community to teach them about um, the way in which you can use technology to serve the business community. He um, provides lots of different content to businesses in Auckland um, through just being creative and using the technology at his fingertips. So we're encouraging him to come through the hub and for our youth to learn um, more about how to develop those skills um, through our digital space. So we're really excited about what a hub and the WIPA could look like. We know that through community co-design um, in Tokoroa, a particular type of hub emerged um, and that really uh, included digital development and entrepreneurial skill. We know that here in the Waipa youth are really important to the community and there were lots of different youth agencies present at our co-design session. What Impact Hub is not is an organisation that tries to usurp or do the work of those organisations. However, what we do do is provide a place and a space for them to collaborate and events and other opportunities that the community behind youth can come together and get behind. That on, beautiful, thank you. So I'm going to tell you a little bit more about the um, community co-design that we've done here in uh, WIPA. But first, I just want to draw on a couple of examples or a few examples from our global network. Um, and so, you know, the beautiful example that we have right on our doorstep from Tokoroa is, um, you know, there are some, some things that will be applicable to the WIPA community and, and a lot of lessons there that we can draw on from the Tokoroa space. Um, there's also a wealth of knowledge um, in the global community. Um, and so in this process uh, of this feasibility study, I've connected with um, Impact Hub makers in um, Bradford, Amsterdam, Bern, Phnom Penh, and Ljubljana. Um, so all over the world. Um, and there's also um, a hub in Chicago that I'm talking to. And they're all really great examples of Impact Hubs that have a very strong youth focus. So again, what it's not is, you know, social services and kind of youth um, support like that, but connecting the dots of what youth need. So in your report, you'll see an example of the Young Impact Makers Program, which is from Amsterdam. Um, and the great thing is about this network is that they're all really willing um, to support us and they've offered help in, in refining our uh, offering. So what we have done locally um, is connect with uh, a large amount of um, community organizations. Um, so as Shane mentioned earlier, we had an in-person session, um, which included um, many of the organizations who are actively involved um, in the entrepreneurial business and youth space. So we had Soda Inc, um, Te Awamutu Youth Development Trust, Te Wananga, Kayanga Ora Community House and Rangatahi Voices in the room with us um, when we did the co-design piece. We asked these advocates what is pushing us forward. So from the perspective of youth, business and entrepreneurship, um, they identified that there are some real gold nugget nuggets in the community. There are some things that are really great, um, but mostly they are informal networks. Um, you know, obviously, we've got the Chamber of Commerce, which is great, um, but there's also a lot of gaps in the support. Um, but there's also some darker forces at play. There are some things that are holding us back. And I don't expect you to read all these words on the, on the skew, um, but there are some things that are holding youth back, holding businesses back and entrepreneurial communities back, such as skill gaps, collaborative frameworks and career pathways. Um, money, of course, is always a thing. Um, 
and you can read more about those in the report. Um, and we identified some ways in which then an inviting community space holds the key to many of these missing pieces. Um, I might skip through these um, because you guys have probably already looked at these slides and I realize that we're now, um, the time is a ticking. Um, but I do just want to highlight, you know, that there is a physical component. Shane has mentioned that we've identified a space in COM2 CBD. Um, there needs to be a physical space in order for this to work. And COM2 CBD is a great place to have such a space. Um, but I think I also just want to, at this point, stress that <clears throat> the support and the professional learning and, and growth transcends the physical space and the boundaries of a particular town. So we are really committed to supporting the wider district as a whole. Um, let's just, yeah, and I think also just want to highlight, you know, the community connection, the opportunities for growth, that network of mentors is incredibly sought after, sought after and there are um, people who are willing and really keen to be a part of this. So in summary, to kind of bring it all together, the proposed offering and what Impact Hub does really well and where we uh, consider ourselves to be experts is in the community development, um, cohesive and um, consolidating the community representatives, um, the entrepreneurial support, as well as the impact innovation and reimagining the way in which we do business and do work in the district. Um, so it's in this. Oh, I didn't have my microphone on. <laughs> Through Trust Waikato, um, in our strategic plan, we intend to open another two hubs in the Waikato region over the course of the next two years, and we would really like that hub to be Waipa. We're excited about the opportunity, um, and Emma and I both have the drive to make it a success. Uh, our experience in building community in Tokoroa has just been hugely uplifting and the way in which community have come around that hub and it has now as a really thriving space um, for youth and entrepreneurs is really um, encouraging. I think we end with, yes. So the development of a hub, as Shane suggested, requires multi-year support. It requires uh, support of $65,000 per year over a three year period. We're perfectly positioned and experienced to bring the hub to life. And we would make this a core strategic and operational priority in our business. Thank you. Thank you guys for listening. I'm gonna stop just sharing the slides now and then we invite you guys to ask any questions that you might have or any comments. Look, uh, thank you very, very much. I think that uh, your enthusiasm is very um, obvious um, to us. So um, is it the end of your presentation, Shane? Yes. Yeah, okay, that's fantastic. Hey, look, I think that you've provided a lot of really, really good further information on what an impact hub is, um, how you could work it, uh, where you could be cited, um, and the international model that you've got obviously as a backbone, I think, um, yeah, really good to kind of base yourselves on, on how, you know, and how things could work. What I'm probably struggling with at the moment is probably the feasibility side of this, 
And I'm really looking for information around the practicality or the assessment of the practicality of, a, of this plan, but also analyzing the viability of the project, which is probably what we asked for in terms of a feasibility study. So have you, is that something you can elaborate on? I'd really like to see the, the, the viability. Um, I don't know if that's, that's not, that's probably more directed at you, Shane, not, not Impact Hub, because you are, you've told us what you do, but we need to see, I guess, a bit of an assessment of, you know, the, uh, the pros and cons um, of what the Tiamudu um, Chamber of Commerce um, has put together as part of that feasibility. Okay, so from uh, the, the Chamber's point of view, um, we, are, we, we see our role is to facilitate this to happen for Te Aumutu. But when it happens, it will be an impact hub operation. So it's their financial, uh, they will be, it's their PL, they'll be the ones running it. And they're the ones that get, that get the funding for it. But we have facilitated it because we saw it as a great idea for Te Aumutu. And it's not something that we will physically be um, responsible for financially but we will certainly be supporting it uh, in terms of an operation. Okay. And the, the, the good news is since the last time we spoke is they have found the funding that now gives them the confidence that they can start this immediately, where before they were struggling to do that, especially through the COVID period, they were going to, to different organisations and finding hard to get funding because of COVID, but now they're in a strong position to actually go ahead and do it. And they have the confidence, it's their call, they will be the one that has a that has a, a financial um, obligation to the uh, owner of the building, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Okay. And yep. maybe just worth adding to that, that um, there is a full business plan and budget that has been developed for the Te Aumutu Hub. We've walked, worked through a few different scenarios um, based on the hubs that we've had before. And so that is able to be submitted to council as well I think that maybe the, there was an overview of it um, yeah so we um, had prepared it um, in order to hand in for this feasibility but because this is a public session and some of that's confidential um, and commercially sensitive information we weren't able to submit it um, so it is something that we have worked on and that we're happy to share um, it, it, it does rely on so I think you know the highlights are kind of in the slide deck and in the study um, that it does rely on support from uh, Waikato District Council and the numbers that we've spoken about. Um, and that the goal and our projections is that it will be financially sustainable and viable in and of its, in, in its own right um, within three to five years. Yeah. Is that, does that answer your question? Because we're <laughs> super happy to share those finance. I'll, I'll, open, I'll open up the floor for, for further questions. Yeah. Clear. <clears throat> Um, thanks, team. It was a great um, presentation. I really enjoyed it. I'm really excited about the idea of having some kind of youth incubator or business incubator that might be actually available for broader um, age groups, I guess, um, in the Waipa. Um, I sort of do agree with um, Liz's, our chair's comments about needing a bit more detail, you know, on those finances. Like one of the questions I had was, um, why couldn't the operational funding that you have secured be applied to the rental so that would reduce perhaps the, the financial requirement that um, the request that's been made to council and things like that. And I was also um, looking carefully at, um, I suppose, the hard numbers on number of um, uh, entrepreneurs that's, that, that began a business or placements that were found with local um, employers and things like that. And also um, the buy-in from perhaps big employers, you know, like we, uh, like here in Waipa, we do have some, some quite large employers that probably spend quite a bit of money on recruitment actually. And perhaps they would be willing to balance some of that recruitment budget, you know, with a way to support your operation or something like that. You know, like those were just some of the questions that I thought might have been um, covered in a feasibility study. And so I guess we would be um, keen to get, get that more detail. I mean, we've just had a presentation about, you know, the sobering economic situation we'll be faced with in the next three years where we're likely to have a recession, which makes it difficult for all businesses. Um, but then that also might mean that central government is going to support, 
you know, some sort of targeted initiative, especially for getting young people that are leaving school or, or um, graduating from university to get them some at least work experience or something. So, you know, there might be opportunities there. So mm. I, I was really impressed with Impact Hub's um, track record. Mm. And I think it's a real strength to be able to um, draw on those networks, you know, internationally as well. Um, yeah, so overall, yeah, pretty excited about it. Um, just worried about, you know, another call on our funds, but, you know, can it be justified and can we see um, some outcomes that would be really well supported by our whole community? Thank you. Thank Thanks, you. Claire. Um, Andrew. Thanks. Yeah, yeah, look, lots of positives, I guess, in the presentation. Like Claire, I'd like to see um, some of the definite outcomes, some, you know, um, actual um businesses started uh, uh, you know um, employment opportunities um found and and filled uh through business hubs activities um quite understand your uh, your um business plan being you know not wanted to be out in a in public forum um at this point however yeah i guess i guess we would like to see that um, to understand how your funding actually works. Um, and just from mm -hmm. the council's point of view, as Claire has said, um, uh, we do our planning on a, on a three yearly basis, well, 10 yearly basis, but it's renewed every three years. Um, we're not really in a position to simply, you know, come up with $65,000 a year um, even though we've been presented with what looks like a really good idea. Um, it, do, it does need to go through a long-term plan process along with all the other projects that are um, uh, put in front of us. Uh, so yeah, that, that well, I guess, you know, my uh, comments were, were we, we still need more information mm. and we're probably looking at a time um, to, to, to make, make a decision. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for that comment. Any other question? Oh, did you want to respond to that? Otherwise, no questions. Uh, Shane, you look like you want to talk. I do. I do. <laughs> um, so I've been pretty close to this, and uh, they have a strategic plan to have two hubs set up within the next two years. One of them could be Tiamudu, or it could not be. Yeah. And really, it sits in this room about whether that's going to occur or not. So. This is the third time we've come to council and we, we keep getting these pushbacks and walls put in front of us. Um, and, you know, the big picture is if we want to do something about youth in Tiamudu, here is a solution. It's on a platter. Yet, do you want it? Yes. Or do you want it? No. These girls work really, really hard and they've been working very hard on this for a long time now and they've got other things that they could be doing. Mm. So look, we would rather have a quick no than a drawn out no, if you know what I mean. So look, I'm not trying to be, I'm just wanna, you know, that's putting the cards on the table. Yep. Um, and, and, you know, I know the issues of funding and, and, and all those things that come with it, but here's a chance, you know, and we've spoken to all these fantastic people in Te Ao Mutu, and then the YPA who give their time and effort to youth, and here's something they want. And we have the opportunity to deliver it to them, yes or no. So that's that's the question in my mind. And maybe just to, to, to put a little positive spin on that as well, I think you know we're in a position at the moment, both Emma and I, with um, both with young families in the YPA, and we, we know that this is where we both want to settle. And, you know, Emma's bought a home here recently. So it, it is definitely um, something that we would be committed to. I do really hear um, your comments um, on wanting to see sort of engagement in the wider community. And I 
just I wanted to share a couple of things around that. One of them is that when we first launched the hub, we had support from council, but not from a lot of other people. But in the process of developing the hub, we found that once we opened the doors and were able to actually welcome people through and see the work that we'd started doing, the support has followed from there. So as an example, we have since opening the doors of Intorporoa, um, secured funding from the Ministry for Pacific Peoples because there's a, a large Pacific community in Tokoroa to fit out 75% of our digital hub, which now has sort of six amazing computers and VR headsets, stuff that the Pacific community and others now have access to. Um, we've also been able to take a pitch proposal through to the Ministry for Culture and Heritage and have secured funding to support a 12-week programme for this year and for next year for community. So, uh, I mean, I think what we're asking for today is a little bit of confidence um, and absolutely acknowledge that that confidence can't be given without full disclosure of a business plan um, and really clear financials. Um, I want to just reiterate that we've we've done that work and we're really happy to submit that openly. Um, maybe not in the public session, but we can submit that to councillors um, for sure. Thank you for that explanation. And I think that that's a big part of what's missing today is, is that um, financial um, analysis, but also the viability of the project. Um, and yeah, perhaps it hasn't been communicated well. Yeah, um, I'll just hand over to Mike, who's got a question. No, no, okay, carry on. No, I, I mean, I, it's, yes, yes, this is interesting to have, but the risk sits here and, and they're prepared to take that risk the risk doesn't sit with you, it sits with Impact Hub. They have the confidence in their financials to take that risk. It, yeah, I, I, I see that there's a reaction to this, so would love to invite the So I, I guess I'll just, I'll just bring it back to what we're here to do today, which is um, obviously receive the report. So, so council has funded the Te Aumutu Chamber of Commerce um, monies for a feasibility report. So that's what we're here to do today is to yeah. consider the feasibility report. Um, I'll ask for, if there's any other questions. Takina, did I see a question from you? Thanks. Oh, kia ora, thank you. Um, I just had a, a few uh, questions around the youth. Um, it mentions Angatahi, but doesn't actually give an age through the document. Is there, is there a number? That, is it like 15 to mm. 30? Um, yeah, so we we definitely focus on the older sort of age range of youth. Um, okay. For example, one of the most recent programs opened for application from 16 years and up, and we found that we had um, that final year of university, uh, sorry, final year of high school um, goers applying for that, those who had sort of a business bent. Um, and yeah, so we, we would say we'd work with the older end of youth, we're definitely not focused on sort of early development and, in, right. and the, yeah, the problems and issues. That's okay. That has created a little bit of confusion for me while I was reading through it. It just didn't give a number as well, but mm, um, yeah. it now makes sense because <clears throat> um, so it's kind of that school lever age kind of. Yeah, and I think it's also, I, I understand that it's a bit vague, but I think it's also because it, it depends a little bit on what the community needs and what we discover along the way, you know, if we can find a program that bridges the gap, you know, from ages sort of 13 to 16, and if there's a need for that, then that's also a possibility. And that those are examples that we're seeing from some of the hubs in the global network that they sort of work with that age range traditionally. However, yeah, Impact Hub will sit kind of in the, you know, 16 to, to 30 um, segment of young people. And yeah. The other thing too, Emma, you mentioned, um poor results around school and stuff like that coming yeah. out of school. Um, how would uh, Impact Hub um, bring these or will help and um, retain them where schools mm. have failed? Yeah, I think I think the important thing there to acknowledge is that the traditional schooling systems is, is obviously not for everybody. Um, so while we can't directly influence school retention rates. Um, we can empower young people to make choices and you know we can provide alternative pathways. Um, we've been speaking to a youth hub that is about to start in Cambridge and, and, and another one that's sort of working in Tewami too. And what, what we're hearing from them is that the people, the young people that don't go to school, um, 
that that problem obviously sits with the school and there's a disengagement and disenfranchisement that sits there between them and their traditional schooling system. But by providing them an alternative pathway, they will find other opportunities that are more suited to their interests and their needs. Mm. Um, so while we will, I think an empowered student and a student who, and a young person who kind of knows themselves and, and has a voice and has a good well-being status, um, if school is the right place for them, then, then that's definitely the place where they need to be. Mm. However, if school is not the right place for them, then there needs to be an alternative. Um, I've got a couple more questions, sorry. Um, mm -hmm. sure. On page 28 of the <coughs> feasibility study, our report, sorry, um, it says um, approximately 65K um, from council. Then at the second to last sentence, it says um, there's tenants will contribute to that greater than 45% of the annual operating cost of space. Does is that the 65 calculated into that or um say, say the page number again, sorry? Uh, 28. 28. Okay, great. Um yeah, so oh, I think I understand what you I think what you're asking is as that um commercial traction grows, um, is the requirement for funding Can oh, diminish, so yeah, yeah, diminished, yeah. yeah. Yeah, so the 45% um, that relates to the, the contacts that we currently have. So even without having signed a lease, you know, we have a list of prospective tenants and members who are who want somewhere to go and are waiting for, for us to essentially provide them with that space. So those are the existing contacts that we have through working with an estate agent who are basically ready to sign on a lease. So that's 45% of the total annual operating um, cost, including the lease, but not exclusively for the lease. That right. makes sense. Yeah, so yeah. those the listed um, examples there, the contractor in the construction industry, the hospitality operator, and, and another small online business, um, they are real businesses that are sitting there um, and who want to be part of the hub. Um, Mm. And so the 65k um, from 65,000 from council, yep. um, where does that sit within the annual operating cost for the space? Is that outside? Like, can we share the total? I think so we can. What, what we can definitely do is just release the full budget to you straight after this meeting. Oh, I'm yeah. very happy, very happy to do that. I think, um, and also maybe share that we've got two different scenarios. Well, we started with three, but worked down to two different scenarios. One is for the Market Street property because we can see it's just super fit for purpose and it's already sort of sitting there and ready to be made fabulous. Um, and the other was for um, a sort of a generic average rent. Um, property somewhere in the in central team. So we've done both. And then what we work toward over a three year period is starting with a certain percentage of occupancy and then growing that year upon year to the point at which the space's operational overheads are completely covered by the end of that third year. And I think also we can share that we're tracking really well toward that through in the Tupero space. I think what um, what didn't go so well was our launch right into lockdown and then we had so we launched into lockdown in October and then we had Omicron hit in March and so for a six month period we did have a real rough time um, but we've yeah we're starting to track toward those um, occupancy levels and then maybe just a really quickly Impact Hub has three business lines so one of them being community development another being entrepreneurial support and the other being impact innovation and so the funding that we're asking for is for operational cover for the actual hub itself mm. and then there are other um, other ways in which we bring in support to ensure that it grew um, over those years my couple I think um sorry last question sure. um, <laughs> we would um Tamatu Chamber of Commerce, like if the hub was operational, so is there some crossover? Yes, around? yeah. Well, we would like to be in the hub, right. have our office in the hub, so we're there to help them. If there's any young person looking for employment that we can connect them with, or any mentors that we have within Tiao Mutu that are part of our membership, they can be supporting. We have uh, people who can um, uh, teach 
different subjects, uh, et cetera, um, because of their experience that we can then give back to the youth that are part of that hub process. So that's where we see ourselves sitting. We also see that we would have a role on the steering and advisory committee um, to assist wherever we can. So we're very, very much a supporter um, and getting that connection between business and youth that is missing. We see that as that being our role. Yeah. Okay, thank, you. <clears throat> yeah. thank you. And sorry, Madam Chair, just one other um, comment. Um, you might have sensed a slight frustration coming from me. Um, the other issue with the frustration is that we have this perfect building that's sitting there waiting and someone else could come and grab it. But it's set up so well that if we miss out on that building, there's probably going to be another $100,000 to find another building to set it up the way that it should be set up. So that's another frustration. So yeah, so okay. I, I do apologise for showing my frustration. But No, no, no. Look, yeah. I think, I think um, Shane, to be brutally honest, I think you could probably sense our frustration. You, like you said, you've been here, this is the third time you visited. Yeah. Um, look, councillors can see the opportunity. We can. But it is a sizable council investment, money, financially. And so what we need to see is a business case, uh, KPIs around that, financials, all the things that you would expect to see in a feasibility study that analyze the viability of a project. So I really, I think it's the next step for us is to, is to see that, is for you to submit that to one of our council yeah, staff members for done. us to... Yeah. Yes, well, we yes we yeah. need to we need to see that, but obviously that needs to be done first. I think we also need to identify the other funding sources that you know that you're looking to um, have within the impact hub mm. um, across YPA. So I think that information for us will be most helpful to see if you have other sponsorship arrangements in place or where you we are looking to to source you know the uh, the the gaps, I suppose. Um, do I mention KPIs? I think I might have. Good. Okay. All right. So look, that's that's where it feels like. Is there any other um, comment around the table? There's, the only comment I'd make is, look, you know, the reality is this is somewhat outside normal ratepayers' funding. Um, we see the benefits. I mean, you've explained them very well, um, but I also think our ratepayers would see. Um, the $195,000 we're talking about is something of a risk that the ratepayers are taking. I, I take that you two ladies are taking a, the substantial risk, much more personal, but um, yeah, I, you know, yeah. We, we need, before we invest yeah. that kind of money to be um, have some real assurances, I guess. Yeah, absolutely. And we're very happy to submit plans and also just to acknowledge that um, you know, the, a community hub is, is really put in place for community and it, it is there to benefit the citizens of this region. Um, and we do, we take that pretty seriously. Um, you know, Emma and I both both live here locally and so it's in our best interest and everyone's best interest to be as um, transparent as we can be with the plans that we've got um, and keep that conversation open with you. I think, um, you know, one of the things we've, set in place in Tokoroa is that um, the community hub needs to have ownership and contribution from lots of different parts of the community. It doesn't go ahead without that. So yeah, thank mm. you. Acknowledge that comment. And, yeah, yeah, definitely acknowledge that the risk from ratepayers and, and from you guys backing this project is very real and it's not something that we take lightly. Um, and it is, yeah, like as, as Manisa said, it's something that we take very seriously and um, you know, we're very willing to to show the work that we've done around that um, to, to put you guys at ease. Ultimately, we do believe that it's that you know that it's a that is a risk not just worth taking, but also an investment that is incredibly important to, to make at this point. I think, especially in the face of a recession. Um, but it, yeah, I just want to say we don't we don't take it lightly. You know, asking for the support. I'm so happy to. To supplement that mm, great more information. thank you all right hey thanks again for coming to see us thank today and uh yeah providing us with that uh, information now i do have a recommendation a and b um if i could have a move and a seconder please thank you claire thank you marcus all in favor
carried. Now, can I just go back to the Treasury update and do a uh, receive? I need to move in a second to receive wow. that information as well. Thank you, um, Councillor Brown and uh, Susan. All in favour? No. Carried. Thank you. All right, everybody. Uh, we are going to move on to the Carter's Flat Local Area Plan. Tony and Josh, welcome. Uh, Kura Tata, I'll just do a couple of introductions if I could. So Josh will be a new host here. I'll let him introduce himself. And in the back seat there, we've got Nicola Holmes, who is week two of our new district plan team leader, replacing Joe Cook Munro. So we're back to full strength in the district plan team. Fantastic um, news. So Josh has pulled this report together. I'll let him take you through the high points. Okay. Yeah, just continue on. Yeah. Kia guys. Cheers. Um, so yeah, I'll take my report as read. Um, but I would like to just cover the key points in the report. Um, so the purpose of the report was just to inform the committee of and to seek their endorsement for the final local area plan um, for Carter's Flat in Cambridge. And so um, currently Carter's Flat is partly zoned commercial and partly zoned bird commercial, which means the industrial zone um, rules apply here. Um, but as a result of strong demand for additional commercial land in Cambridge uh, and the wider district, uh, Waipa District Council has sought to repurpose Carter's Flat um, via proposed plan change 19 from an industrial and commercial area to a mixed use commercial area um, that enables a combination of larger format commercial activities along with apartment living. And so this involves uplifting the deferred commercial zoning to commercial zoning. Um, and so as a result, Council has prepared a local area plan for Carter's Flat, which basically just sets out um, an overall urban design vision uh, and aims to guide future development and investment in the area. Um, it also aims to develop the vision for the Cambridge, Cambridge Town Concept Plan refresh of 2019 and provide a framework for its implementation. Um, it's also important to note here that local area plan for Carter's Flat is the first of its kind. Uh, and these plat plans are not prepared under the RMA, which means there are no statutory requirements or legal uh, implications associated with it. Um, and so prior consultation was undertaken with the range of stakeholders, including business owners in the area. And council met with a representative from Nati Koroki Kaukura for the purposes of iwi consultation but no further feedback was received on iwi or cultural matters. And then finally, uh, the local area plan for Carter's Flat was notified for feedback at the same time that proposed plan change 19 was publicly notified for submissions, which was the 25th of August this year. Um, only one person provided public feedback and it was in support of the local area plan. However, the submitter raised concerns about the overemphasis to prioritize vehicles on roads um, rather than multimodal forms of transport. And so we reform, uh, informed the submitter that we'll keep him in the loop for any future local area plan updates and changes. Um, and so having considered all of the feedback, council staff recommend no further changes to the local area plan for Carter's Flat. And so the final step is to seek endorsement from the from the committee. Thanks. Thank you, Josh. I'll open up the floor for questions. We've got Lou and then Marcus in Takina. Yeah, thank you very much. Through you, uh, Madam Chair. I'd, I'd like to just very say that this is a great solution, and I think it's going well. And I've had some very positive responses from people that actually resulted in Carter Slat. So I would uh, take this opportunity to congratulate the team and congratulate your report. And I'd actually uh, move or formally move that we adopt the uh, concern the endorse the local plan area plan. Thank you, Lou. Marcus. Oh, well, I'm <laughs> oh, wow. Goodness me. <laughs> okay, I'll, I'll, I'll put the motions and things later. Um, it's probably worth, sorry, it's probably worth just on the back of that to acknowledge the consultants who helped us with that. So they're not on their own, but um, Becca pulled this together. So they, They've got some very, very good smarts around urban design and also planning. Um, and so they led this piece of work for us. So we're very impressed with their piece of work. Yeah, okay, no, thanks, Tony. Was there anyone else that wanted to make a comment? Takina, yeah. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I, I just wanted to um, 
touch on uh, the um, con consulting with mana whenua. I know there's a there's two pass sites on there and uh, um, within that area. Um, it doesn't say whether or not um, that person was an iwi member or a, a representative of Ngāti Koroki Kaukura Trust. The difference is quite big and I think um, should be noted. Yeah, just, just um, I suppose to um, ensure that we're talking to the right people around decisions made where the parasites are concerned. Um, yeah. I uh, acknowledge that. So the iwi consultation was, was fairly extensive. So um, we've got quite an extensive list. And we didn't just stop at uh, Ngāti Kuriki Kahikura. Um, we, we engaged with all our mana whenua iwi um, by email. Um, Nita Bellari, who was running this piece of work, um, we asked her to follow up phone calls with our contacts. Um, and that's a contact provided to us by our in-house um, iwi advisors. Um, so we should have been hitting the right people there. Um, NKK did go through a change at the time. So I met with um, Beth Tauroa um, just when she came on board and we gave her an update on this and she uh, said that she'd go back to the trust with any, or come back to us after she's spoken to the trustees around any feedback. Um, we didn't get any feedback consequently around that. Um, I'm not fully with the past sites down there. So this, this is the area that's already well developed down there and there may be historical sites on the area that's already developed. So um, you might not be familiar with the plan change itself, but the plan change is just seeking to live zone from industrial to commercial. So the area plan is actually sort of enhancing what's down there. I guess if there's opportunities that come through and it didn't come through the local area plan for interpretation or acknowledgement or something like that, that's certainly something we could consider. So thank you for that. Oh, kia ora, Tony. No, I thought if you were in and around it, you quite robust and talking to you um, in mana whenua. Um, one more question. Um, I note that there are a number of hail sites. Um, what impact would those have? Because presumably there'll be uh, new buildings going in at the, on the sites. So does that pose a risk for council? Like who has to pay for the cleanup? Yeah, that's if really, any. If that's any. a really good question. Um, so there has been industrial down there for some time. And some of those sites um, certainly will be hail sites. So we're aware of that. Um, the way I think that will happen is as those industrial activities take the opportunity to relocate, if there's no change to the building footprint, then those sites won't be disturbed. But if there's reconstruction or redevelopment down there, then that would trigger an investigation under the hail status. So, so those are the significant uh, contaminated sites. Um, we're aware of one industry there, and I, I can't mention any more about it, but they are looking, they, they purchased a piece of land out of Aotearoa and did exactly what we were intending this plan change, also plan change 17 would do. So try and encourage and incentivize some of those industries to relocate. So we're aware of one relatively heavy industry that's mm -hmm. already in that process of doing that. Um, we don't know what the back fill for their site will be, but it's a potentially developable site. Um, so certainly that'll be a big investigation if that gets developed. It's a good question. Yeah. Mm, clear. Yeah. Um, thanks, yeah. Um, certainly echo everyone's praise for the really um, great um, local area plan. It looks really good. But, so the question I have is around the fact that it's, it doesn't have any statutory um, I suppose standing, yeah, it's not part of the RMA. So does that mean that there's a risk that even though we adopt it and you know we've got good support locally, that when it comes to a development, we can't actually say you've got to do it this way. Yeah. So in fact, we might do all this wonderful work, but in the end it actually comes down to a decision made by the landowner and they may not well put into practice all the things that we have. Another good question. So we did consider at the outset whether the local area plan should be part of the district plan. Um, and we took, I suppose, our, our guide from the town concept plans, which typically part, aren't part of the district plan. So we didn't need a structure plan because there's already a structure plan down there, already a structure down there. So there's already a footprint. So um, we followed, I suppose, our standard process of it being outside the district plan. But you're right, what that means is there is a design guide in the local area plan. And the way it will work is for any permitted activities, 
um, we'll encourage, promote, and hold up the local area plan and say, yeah, this is something that you should aspire to. Where there are consented activities, then it is a, an other matter that we can bring into the consent process. Um, design guides are a little bit uh, light on terms of a regulatory weight that we can apply to them, but we do have some tools if a consent is triggered to use them. Thanks. Mm. Right, I think that probably sums up most of the questions. Um, look, I, we've, we've been working on this plan for a wee while now, um, and I've, you know it's always been just a, a natural progression, really, to, to start movement, it's particularly because a number of those um, landowners and business owners want to relocate or signal that they're kind of keen to, to they don't have enough space down there. So um, again, thanks to thanks to Becca. Um, I also wanted just to say thanks to the Cambridge Chamber of Commerce. I think that Kelly in particular has been really involved in this in this um, plan change and has been really active, um, you know, in promoting and making sure everyone's sort of well aware of what was going on down there as well, especially on the webinars. So I think that was really helpful. Um, and Josh, well done. <laughs> so look, I will um, I will put the motion now. We have a mover, which is Lou. Marcus was seconding that. Um, all in favour? Aye. Carried. Okay, thanks. Right, our uh, next item is our quarterly district growth report. Wayne Allen is here. Is Roger back online? Yes. Yeah. And Roger has joined us back online. Hi, Roger. Welcome back. Oh, not quite back yet. Ben. All right. Okay. Well, good morning, uh, Madam Chair, Your Worship, and councillors. Last item before lunch. So uh, I'll try and get through it reasonably quickly. Um, nearly on time. So um, we're not, I'm just going to take the report generally as read. I'll touch on some of the key the key points um, as, as I traverse through it. <clears throat> the first key point I um, just wanted to discuss is the uh, resource management reforms. Um, so as you know, government's released the two bills um, on 15th of November, introduced into parliament. So that's the natural built in environment uh, bill, which will replace the RMA and the spatial planning uh, bill, which mandates regional spatial strategies for each region. Um, the government has um, announced that the submission period closes on the 30th of January, a very unhelpful timeframe for local government because there's not really a opportunity to loop back to elected members uh, in most cases, uh, I'd imagine in January because a number of um, councils won't have meetings in January. So we have made a request um, to uh, MFE if we can extend that time frame at least into a couple of weeks into February, because what our plan was that was to hit the February SPMP committee with a draft submission to run past um, the committee members. Um, if the submission period closes on the 30th of January, don't have that opportunity. Um, so <clears throat> if it stays at 30th of January, then I guess the question to you is, how, how do you want us to loop back on any submission we're preparing? What we're doing is um, we've got a getting a council staff uh, RMA reform review team established and we're reviewing the bills to prepare a council submission. Um, there's a number of webinars going on um, over the next week or two, uh, introducing the RMA bills, uh, reform bills and the, and the spatial planning bill. Um, and during that time in December and January, we'll be looking at pulling that submission together. So whether there, there is a um, opportunity there for elected members or subcommittee elected members that want to be involved with the staff in preparing a submission or whether you just want us to circulate a draft submission in January, um, prior to lodgement on the 30th of January. I'll just be interested in your feedback on, on that one. So I'd, perhaps I'll just pause there and just get some feedback from elected members on that point. Okay, open for comments, Marcus. I think if it could either just be circulated to us and we can provide comments and things because we don't have to be here, but um, we can actively work on it either through diligent and stuff using the questionnaire options and things like that and provide feedback like that. Everyone happy with that? Yeah. Yes, we'll just receive the draft one over the January holiday period, I guess we'll call it, uh, and, and we'll just submit our feedback back through the team. Everyone's happy with that, that'll be good. Yes, that's fine. Um, thank you for that feedback. 
we'll, we'll wait and see whether our request to uh, MFE um, gets any traction and allows for the extension of the time. If it does, then we will we will have the opportunity in February's SPMP committee to talk a bit more about the reforms um, and our submission. Uh, some other points just to touch on. Um, the district plan um, changes. So uh, the report, the growth report deals with, with all the, uh, the, the plan changes. Um, PC 26, which is a residential zone intensification plan change. The submissions have closed um, on that on the 30th of September with 79 submissions. Uh, the further submission process um, is, is on now, closes 12th of December. Uh, PC 17, the Hautapu Industrial um, Plan Change submissions closed with 28 submissions. Um, further submissions um, period uh, starts next Monday, 5th of December. Um, good work on the PC 19 commercial zone. Just heard about the Carter's Flat um, plan. So the actual plan change and no submissions has a report coming to council in December to make that operative. And plan change 27, um, also the Papa Kainga one, uh, that will go to the December council meeting. Um, and as you know, we've progressed, progressed a draft uh, scoping report in that one. So that's all I wanted to say on the plan changes. Uh, other parts of the report, um, I'll just touch on, put some information in there about the de development contributions um, figures that we're getting in. Um, and also information coming into the Audit and Risk Committee um, uh, meetings as well. So um, made it quite um, a highlight, I guess, uh, the DC notices that we've issued, the amounts charged and the revenue received uh, in that report. And as you say, as you can see in this quarter, we issued 66 uh, DC notices. We charged 9.8 million and today for that quarter, we received 1.5 million. But interesting in terms of the figures overall, um, in terms of the total DCs outstanding, there it's 54.5 million. Uh, and then if you add in um, uh, developments with 3Ms and Ryman is another 20 million there. Wayne, you know, just, just on that um, DC collection, yeah, I was wondering if we could have a bit more information on um, the the number of days from when it was issued to when it's being paid, or you know, like like um, it's personally, I'd like more information than just the quarterly figures because I'd like to know, um, yeah, how many days um, the 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 notice has been outstanding. Yes, and whether or not that's been you know an age of debtors. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So I, yeah. that could be quite an extensive list. Um, and you have to bear in mind that uh, a subdivision process could go for eight years uh, to realise a 224 certification. Yeah. Um, and most development contributions are paid at 224 stage. Uh, so, yeah, I'm just want, wanting to explore a little bit more of the purpose of that information because it would be sort of a yeah. quite a task in extracting it. Yeah, so my understanding would be that what 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 um, council finances are interested in is is from the date the two two four certificate is issued because that's when um, the DC becomes payable. So the time period from when that two two four is issued to when the payment is received. Uh, the, the, two, the, the DC should be paid at the time of issue of the two two four. Oh, I see. There's no time delay there. Oh, oh okay. Uh, unless there's a separate agreement that. Um, they pay at um, building consent stage, which there's not many of those out there on that basis. Oh, okay. All right. Sorry. When I when I read this, I thought, oh, we we're expecting to get this money in and we're not getting it in. And yeah. of course, there's always a cost of, yes. of um, financing that in the meantime, especially with interest rates increasing. And there's a mechanism for us to collect in interest um, from developers but I wanted to make sure that that mechanism is fair on the developers that are actually causing the holdup, not the developers further along who are going to have to pay the interest as well. That's what I'm interested in, whether or not we've got our, our finger on the pulse as to make sure that we're receiving the money in, in a timely fashion. And if not, uh, the, the extra charges um, being met by the people that should be meeting them and not falling on others. Yeah, so I'll just reiterate the, the DC notices are, are charged at the time of issue of the subdivision consent, 
and uh, we're in the hands of the developers to some extent of when they uh, realise their 224 certification uh, under the legislation. Um, and there is no additional interest component, unfortunately, that we can impose on the DC that has already been uh, issued in terms of the notice. So um, what we are trying to do is, um, I guess, highlight a lot more about what notices we are issuing how much we've charged and how much is received, and perhaps even drilling down to growth cell areas as well, and, and getting an understanding of the investment that the council's putting into those growth cells, uh, as well as the revenue that's coming in from the DCs and any mismatch in timing. I think that might be a good way to explore that area. So we'll have a look at that point. Thank you. Um, so just the other point I just want to quickly um, elaborate on is just on the building consent side of things. So I was just talking to my team lead um, in building consents um, about um, whether they're, whether she's noticing any sort of slowdown in the numbers of building consent um, applications. Generally um, for this quarter, and we're talking July, August, September, um, the average number of building consents re received is slightly increased in the same quarterly period as last year. Um, but if you look at the last two months, including October, which is not this quarter, um, we've, there's been just a, there's been a slight reduction, but in saying that we're probably about one or 2% in October. So compared to some other uh, areas in the Waikato, we might be experiencing 10 to 15% reductions. You know, it's not out of order and it could easily bounce back in November. I don't have the November figures. Um, and other points that was made is, um, We've, for example, processed all the processed a lot of the units in the Ryman C2 growth cell in Cambridge. It's a retirement village, and the Somerset one in, in Cambridge North. Um, they're now com coming in. So for the Ryman's, we're now moving into inspections. The Somersets are still still coming in with uh, their units for um, for uh, for processing. And the other comment that was made is that the jobs are probably not as big. Um, we're getting a lot of amendments because of the product issues. Uh, product changes. So, um, you know, a lot of, um, change, uh, I guess, additions to, to houses, for example. So that was just some observations there in the, in the building descent side of things. Um, the other point I just wanted to clarify um, on page 192, um, just on the figure five, unfortunately, um, we've just, um, for the bar graph, we have shown for the littering um, for 2022, 12, um, 12, it should actually be uh, 22. What we've done in, in the littering and parking, 12 and 99, we've actually put in the actual infringement notices rather than complaints. So littering 12 should be 22. And for parking complaints, we've had 69 complaints, not 99. What we've had is 99 infringements issued. So I just wanted to clarify that, that bar graph um, need it, needs to be updated. Um, that's probably all um, that I'd like to say in relation to the to the quarterly report. Unless there's any other further questions. Thank you, Wayne. Questions? We've got one from Andrew. Yeah, thanks. Liz. Uh, just going back to the DCs and and collections and all that. So I I, I gather that we actually do have some interest rate risk between the issuing of, God, I'll get the terminology wrong, but, but, but when our DC notice goes out and in fact um, uh, the 224s are issued and, and payments received. So we have an interest rate risk in that, in that space, that period there. What I'd say is you have an interest, I'm not in the finance team obviously, but um, you would have a interest concern on loans so if we are taking out loans to fund infrastructure and that forms part of a development agreement uh, and a DC notice, yes. Um, but there may be, um, or there will be, DC notices that don't, are not necessarily associated with loan requirements, it's just a contribution for, for their component of their development. There would not be any interest associated with that. Hopefully I've got that answer right. <laughs> Thanks, Wayne. Okay, any other questions? Lou? 
thank you. I, I, I'm developing a little bit along with uh, Andrew, or Councillor Brown said. Um, what, what concerns me here with the OCR going up as rapidly as it is, and we will be obviously being hit by this, uh, we could have this risk factor, particularly over a few months. And I see the figure was around $54,000 that we, a uh, million dollars, sorry, that we've got sitting up there. What's it? That, that's a figure of, or a fund that is sitting out there that we've actually projected out, or is how much of that is actually going to have an interest content? Yeah, I don't, I don't have that information here. Um, obviously, that fifty, yeah, the fifty-four million um, development contributions that have yet to be paid, that would be associated with um, some council loans and therefore an, an interest rate issue. Um, and some will be just DC notices that um, are just normal contributions. Uh, I guess the the challenge that we've got is to make sure that our capital investment that we're putting into the um, into the uh, mainly in the ground, effectively with our three waters uh, and our roading, um, that we don't uh, put that in too early before development and before we actually get you know, the revenue. So. We need to make sure that we match um, our investment with the revenue that we are getting. So we don't want to invest in pipes, invest in roads, and then just have um, developers not realising their 224 certifications, or um, you know people not selling the sections and the like, um, and therefore we don't, you know, we don't actually see the revenue coming in. So yeah, it's a constant um, balance um, and working with developers on that point. So that's where I see the risk in terms of that interest, um, but I need to probably need a finance person along to help me on that one. Okay. Uh, Takina. Thank you, Minute Chair. Uh, just a quick question. Um, the DCs, do those include um, roads that, get, that come back to, uh, to council and land, you know, the parks, reserves and stuff like that. Yeah, okay. Uh, so, yeah, the question about um, the the makeup of the development contributions, whether it incorporates roads and reserves. Uh, uh, so roads are, yeah, they're vested in the, in the council. Um, if they uh, if they collect the roads um, that we have to go in and buy um, and therefore take loans out, um, then there is an interest rate component on that. Um, and development contributions are required from developers, as is uh, reserve acquisition um, that you mentioned. So if we're purchasing reserve land for the benefit of the subdivision and the wider community, then we refund that. We get, um, we impose that on development contributions as well. So it's not a, uh, not a rate payer cost, I guess, is it? That's the point. If it's growth related, either developers put in the roads uh, or if they collect the roads, um, we will fund it and share that cost burden amongst all the beneficiaries. I guess, um, yeah, thanks for that. Um, more around how much of this is cash and how much of it would be the roads being vested back, <coughs> if any. How much is cash and how much is roads to be vested back? I'm not sure I understand that question, sorry. Um, yeah, I could be wrong here. But, um, so uh, the DC, the DCs that you've uh, highlighted here, is that all um, charges in terms of the fees, or does that include those components we just talked about, the roads? And yeah. So the the development contributions are outstanding associated with infrastructure. Um, so uh, if there, if or contributions towards it. So we have our development contribution schedule. You pay contributions for roading, you pay contributions for the three waters, um, you pay contributions for reserves. And so um, those notices are made up of um, their contributions towards that infrastructure. Does that sort of answer your question? Okay. Wayne, I think what we're asking for here, if I'm reading the room right, is that the development contributions outstanding versus paid isn't the metric we're after. What we're after is how the phasing is going between the capital expenditure by council and uh, and, and what remains unpaid of that, because yep. that is our true exposure, yep. where we're potentially going to get caught in a falling market holding the baby. 
Yes, I've got that point. Um, and as I sort of indicated, we're, we're still working up um, the, the costs um, associated with each growth cell and the revenue being received. And I think uh, once you identify the costs, um, i.e. if you're taking out loans to put in infrastructure, if we have that interest rate risk um, and understand what revenue is coming in for that growth cell, I think that's the answer to your question. And yeah, we're getting that information. Yeah. Perfect. Okay. Thank you, Wayne. Thank you, Mike. Everybody. All right. Thank you. All righty. Are there no, any other queries on that? Otherwise, we'll just uh, receive the report. Claire's happy to move. Takina is happy to second. All in favour? Carried. Okay, everybody, we will, that is actually the end of our formal meeting. Uh, we will break now for lunch and we will come back uh, in half an hour, so about 12.20. Um, no, sorry, 12.40, because I, yeah, 12, let's say 12.45. Um, and uh, we'll have our workshops for this afternoon.